This is great. I think there are even extra tables here tonight. So uh, thanks very much for your affirmation. Uh, as you know, uh, we are, uh, as a church, uh, painting a portrait of Christ during this Lenten season. And uh, I'm doing so from the Old Testament. And we're considering the character of Elijah. And so uh, let's read, read a little scripture. If you have your Bible, you're welcome to open it to 1 Kings. And uh, remember, uh, don't be afraid to use the table of contents. That's what it's there for. If you have a difficult time finding some of those Old Testament passages, like Habakkuk or one of those books, then look in the table of contents and it will direct you there. Now I'm going to read just a, a little background passage here from 1 Kings chapter 16, which tells us what the culture was like in the northern part of Israel where Elijah lived. I read to you from God's word, beginning at verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. So it's an evil kingdom, a pagan uh, kingdom, in which uh, Elijah uh, is called to be God's man, to speak God's word. And last week, we talked about the announcement that he made. It's not going to rain around here until I say so. And then... Uh, he was called by the Spirit to go uh, to the Kareth Ravine, and we paralleled that with the fact that after Jesus was announced, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Jesus was called into the wilderness to be tried and tempted. And so we pick up the story now in 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning at verse 7. And again, I read to you from God's Word. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. When the word of the Lord came to him, I need to get you on the right slide. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord God, your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with the word of the Lord, spoken by Elijah. Here ends the reading of God's word. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you have seen uh, the movie, Jesus Revolution, then uh, you are aware of the story of a, a great revival that took place in the late 1960s and early 1970s. I lived through that, as uh, some of you who are my age uh, uh, did as well. Some of you who are a little, little younger uh, may have seen that movie and wondered if America ever could have looked like that. 
I lived through it not on the West Coast. I lived through it on the East Coast uh, in the Boston area where there were a lot more draft dodgers than there were Jesus people. But uh, as we see a movie like that, uh, we can't help as Christians but wish that maybe there could be a, an awakening like that in our country again. Let's face it, we need a revival, don't we, in this land. And it would be wonderful if uh, something like that were to occur to again, where hundreds of thousands of young people would come to Christ and, and would foster a whole new generation uh, that would uh, launch the church into a new era. Well, the story that we're going to consider tonight has all of the elements that are necessary to generate a revival. And that's what we'll consider as, uh, as we look at these verses from 1 Kings chapter 17. Oops, I went one too far. I'm getting used to the presenter here. Now, a reminder to you that uh, Elijah is the Christ figure of the Old Testament. Now, I know uh, a person at last week asked me, well, wasn't Joseph the Christ figure of the Old Testament? Well, yes, he was. Uh, well, how about Moses? Well, certainly Moses uh, did Christ-like things, or David? Absolutely. Uh, but uh, I consider Elijah to be special because none of those other characters uh, did the things that Elijah did. None of them multiplied food, and none of them, through the power of God's Spirit, caused a little boy to come back to life. Elijah is the Christ figure of the Old Testament from my perspective, and of course, I want you to be aware of how to tell the difference between Elijah and Elisha, and we use uh, the letter in the middle of their names, Elijah, with a J, reminds us of Jesus. Elijah did the things that Jesus would do. And he was followed by Elisha, S, in the middle of his name, just as S follows J in the alphabet. And Elisha did the things that the spirit or the saints in the early church would do. Now, last week, uh, we left uh, Elijah in the Kareth Ravine, in the cutting place. For 18 months, he was fed by ravens, and he was tested in that cutting place. And uh, he wondered during those years, uh, th during those months, what it was that God was doing. And then, as we read in our passage of Scripture tonight, the brook dried up, and he was sent uh, to a place that he never would have expected to have to go. He was sent to a, a little town called Zarephath in uh, the region of Sidon. And Sidon was outside of Israel. And you can see on this map, you can see where the, uh, the Kareth Brook is over in Gilead. And notice that he didn't travel to the west through Palestine, through Samaria, where King Ahab and Queen Jezebel might have been. He went directly north, probably all the way to Mount Hermon, and then crossed over into uh, the pagan land of, uh, of Sidon, of Zarephath. And here, in these passages of Scripture, uh, we find that he's involved in two miracles over the next two years. And one is the multipl multiplication of food, and then the second miracle is the restoration of life. And you know, a lot of times we can read the Old Testament and we think, oh, these are wonderful stories. How do they relate to me? Well, I believe that both of these miracles relate to us spiritually right where we are here today in America. And both of these miracles are elements that the church is going to have to utilize if there is going to be a revival in this land. Let me tell you a, a little bit about Zarephath. Uh, the word Zarephath means refining. So Elijah went from the cutting place, the place of temptation and trial, he went to the crucible of refinement. Uh, or we might say he went out of the frying pan into the fire. You see, uh, Sidon was Queen Jezebel's home territory. 
Sidon, uh, Zarephath, uh, Sidon was a, a pagan land. A Baal worship and the worship of Asherah were common there. And uh, Elijah would be looked for. He would be hunted there because by this time, after 18 months of no rain in the agricultural reason, region of Israel, Ahab was getting desperate. And so uh, if there was any sighting of Elijah anywhere, you know that, Eli that Ahab was going to be after him. And yet, where does God send Elijah? He sends him to, to the devil's backyard. He sends him to Jezebel's home territory. And he didn't know how he was going to be provided for, but he's told that a widow, one of the poorest in the land, and we know that in this time in biblical history, uh, widows were usually destitute. Uh, they usually had very, very little. And he's going to go there, and he's going to not only have a widow provide for him, but he's going to live with the widow. And again, I, I don't want to suggest impropriety, because as we read on here, we find that there was a separate room, an upstairs room for Elijah. But nevertheless, he was going to be dependent upon one of the poorest in the land. You see, spiritually, because of their unfaithfulness, Israel had become a widow. God had, had pushed them away because of their idolatry and their unfaithfulness. And now God was going to enable Elijah to experience that. He was going to live with a widow. He was going to see what it was like to be totally and completely destitute. And yet God was going to provide for him through that experience. You see, God brought Elijah into uh, the presence of God, his own presence, in a, an incredibly desperate situation. Now, we've, uh, we've read this passage before. And, of course, uh, Elijah uh, goes to Zarephath, as uh, he's commanded to do, and uh, he sees the woman and he asks her to bring him a drink. Uh, we don't know how he knew it was the right woman. We just know that uh, those things happen when God is in, in control. And uh, they run into one another, and he asks for a drink. And, uh, oh, by the way, would you bring me a pancake? And uh, he didn't ask for syrup, thankfully, but uh, he did ask for a pancake. And she said, look, uh, all I've got is a, a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. And uh, we were going to make a couple of pancakes and eat them. And that's probably what's going to be it for us because of this awful, awful drought and the poverty in which we are in. And uh, uh, Elijah assured, assured her that uh, it would be all right. Again, this passage of scripture, uh, which we've already read, he sent her on her way. And uh, she... Uh, in some mysterious fashion, we know it wasn't mysterious, it was the, the intervention of the Holy Spirit prompting her and assuring her that indeed this was God's man who spoke God's word. She went home and baked the little cake of bread, the little pancake, brought it back to him, and Elijah said, here's what's going to happen. Until it rains again, uh, your flour bin is always going to have flour and your jug of oil is always going to have oil. And I imagine she just shook her head and said, yeah, right. And yet, for the next two years, the Lord sustained Elijah and the widow and her son in that miraculous fashion. You see, what made no sense at all, God knew was going to be all right. And oftentimes when we confront those nonsensical situations in our lives. God knows it's going to be all right. We have but to trust in him. Now, I don't want to miss the symbolism in this passage of Scripture because we can just read right over it and say, well, that's very nice. That has no application to me whatsoever. But it does. You see, the, the flower uh, is God's sustenance. And it's, it's like the manna in the Old Testament, as we read about the Israelites out in the wilderness, every morning going out and gathering the manna and then taking it and grinding it and making and baking things with it. By the way, do you know what uh, 
the favorite recipe was for the Israelites who uh, lived in the wilderness? It was banana bread. <laughs> Throughout the scriptures, manna and bread are the equivalent of God's provision. Not just physical provision, but spiritual provision. And that applies to us today. What is it that we as believers in Jesus Christ can do every single day in order to be spiritually nourished? We can open God's word, can we not? And read it. And as we do, we are nourished spiritually. And so we see in this passage of scripture that we're talking more than just about physical nourishment for Elijah and the widow and her son but we're talking about spiritual nourishment for us that's provided miraculously by the one who speaks God's word through God's word, uh, through Jesus himself. And then the oil is also important. Again, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament tabernacle, there were lampstands. And uh, those lampstands were to be kept lit all the time. There was always to be light in the tabernacle. And what was the power source for those lampstands? Oil. It was oil. And what is the power source for us in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ? It's the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of God's Spirit in our lives. It's the Spirit of God who fills us and keeps us bright and burning as testimonies for the Lord Jesus. And how is that provided? Through God's person. In the Old Testament, it was Elijah. For us, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Look at all the parallels that uh, we have between Elijah and Jesus. He went to Sidon. Well, in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus went to Sidon as well, did he not? And uh, Elijah spoke to a woman and asked for a drink. And Jesus did that as well, did he not? The, uh, the woman at the well, John chapter 4. He asked a, a pagan woman for a drink. Uh, Elijah ministered to this Gentile woman. And so did Jesus when he was in Sidon. He ministered to a Gentile woman whose little girl was demon-possessed. And guess what they had a conversation about? Bread. They talked about bread. Isn't that interesting? Elijah is there talking with a woman about bread, and 800 years later, Jesus is in Zidon talking about bread. Remember the context of the story? The woman came begging Jesus to help her. And Jesus said, it's not right for me to give the bread that belongs to the children of Israel to a Gentile. And the woman responded by saying, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall under the table. And Jesus was so impressed with her faith and her answer that her little girl was healed there in Sidon. And then Elijah multiplies food, food and oil. Jesus two times multiplies food. John chapter 6, the feeding of the 4,000, and back in uh, the 5,000 in John 6, and then back in Matthew 15, the feeding of the 4,000. And then, as we're going to see in just a couple of minutes, the raising to life of a little boy. And we know that Jesus did the same. Uh, the widow of Nain's son was being carried off in the coffin, and Jesus said, little boy, get up. And so he did. Life was restored to him. Well, I want you to see that all of this comes together in this passage of Scripture in John chapter 6, where after the feeding of the 5,000, using bread... Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. You see, it's Jesus that nourishes us. It's Jesus that provides his nourishment to us through his word. Jesus is the living word. The Bible is the written word. As we read the written word, we are nourished and pointed to the portrait of Christ, Jesus himself, the living word.
and then we are filled with the Spirit of God. The pancake is complete, and we are empowered to be lights in this community and in this world. Well, we want to go on quickly to the second miracle in this story. And so I continue reading from 1 Kings chapter 17. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. I'll stop there for just a minute. Elijah stretched himself out on the dead boy three times and cried, let this boy live. I want you to think about the fact that Jesus stretched himself out on the cross and for three days was stretched out upon death itself. And then God cried, let this boy live. And on Easter Sunday, he came back to life, not only so that he would live, but he would be the first fruits of the resurrection. And all of us who are sinners can live as well. We see a in this passage of scripture, 800 years before Jesus, a, a foreshadowing of the work of redemption that would be accomplished on the cross and the promise of a restoration of life to all who allowed Jesus to spread themselves out upon them. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I read on here quickly. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The word of God, the bread of life. You know, we used to sing a hymn I grew up as a Baptist, and in the old Baptist church, we used to sing the hymn, Break Thou the Bread of Life, Dear Lord to Me. And, and that was a prayer to open God's Word. And as we open the Word of God, as we break forth the bread of life, we receive spiritual nourishment, and we're directed to Jesus, the living Word, who gives us life through His death on the cross and His resurrection from the grave. Elijah brought the widow's offspring back to life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, through his death on the cross, brought the offspring of Israel back to life. And that offspring of Israel is alive in a new Israel, which we call the church. And we're part of that. You know, the, the objective of Israel, the goal of the nation of Israel, as we read in the book of Genesis, was to be a blessing to the world, to tell the world about God, and thus bless the world through that proclamation. But Israel failed in that task because of their unfaithfulness. And even in Jesus' day, they had failed. They continued to fail through their Pharisaic legalism, for their lack of love for their humankind. They had totally blown the offspring, the objective of what they were all about. And yet, through Christ's death on the cross, there was revival that was brought back to life. The offspring was revived. The goal was now intact. And it, uh, it lives on in the church of Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at these parallels. As we do so, let's think about how this story relates to us today. We've already talked about uh, the Word of God, the bread of life. We've talked about the power of the Holy Spirit. But uh, 
let's try to pull it all together as we pick up this story and set it down in uh, the United States of America in 2023. Zarephath is a lot like our world. It's the devil's backyard. It's a place uh, where uh, out in the public, uh, as a Christian, you can be criticized very, very easily. Uh, you perhaps can even be persecuted. And the widow, perhaps today, is the church. We've just come through COVID, and uh, you know and I know, uh, polls have told us that church attendance in America is at its all-time low since anybody has ever kept records. There are fewer people attending church today in our country. And what used to be the, the, the offspring of the church was a mission, was mission and evangelism. Uh, you know, I grew up in the Baptist church as a kid, and that's all we heard about. Uh, mission, 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 sharing the gospel, telling others about Jesus Christ. And now half the churches in America are just trying to survive. They're looking inward and they're not looking outward. So what are the elements for a revival? Well, we need some never-ending oil and bread, don't we? We need to be in the scriptures daily and become nourished as we read God's word together. We need to be filled regularly with the power of God's spirit so that we can capture a vision for evangelism, for mission, for the offspring that the church ought to have. We need a revival because the life that seems to be diminished needs to be restored. And as Elijah was the agent for that in ancient Israel, so it's Jesus. That's who we're talking about. It's Jesus who is the agent for that in our world today. So if we're living in Zarephath, then... This is a good time of the year for us to focus on Jesus because only Jesus can, can provide life. Only his word can provide spiritual nourishment. Only his spirit can fill us and keep us burning brightly. We need a revival in this country. You know that. Wouldn't it be great if it started in Pittsburgh? If a revival were to start in Pittsburgh, where would it break out? Where would it begin? How about here? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this Old Testament story. We thank you for the emphasis upon the power of God's word to point us to Jesus. We thank you for... Uh, the oil of the Spirit, which enlivens us and empowers us uh, to be the, the light of the world. And we thank you, Lord, that as we look to you, uh, you have given us light, life, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we pray that you will use us to bring light to Zarephath, to the place where we live. We pray, pray in Jesus' name. Amen.